I will do my best to. Oh, there we go. All right. Moderate my voice so I don't uh, scream through the microphone. Anyhow, it is my pleasure to be here. It's uh, also my pleasure to, uh, to to be in the home of David Horrell. I've, I've been a fan of uh, Horrell charts uh, since I was first introduced to them. Um, what I'll talk to you today about first is uh, some experiences that uh, my colleagues and I have had uh, working with customers and also our own personal experiences in adopting model-based design. And then this afternoon, I'll talk about some best practices in large-scale modeling. Um, so a quick review, you know, what is model-based design? So if we look at a traditional system, usually there's research and requirements and these are done uh, in, in terms of documents. Uh, my, my least favorite system to use is DOORS. It also tends to be the most pervasive system to capture requirements. And whether it's English, Hebrew, French, or whatever, a natural spoken language is a very challenging way to capture requirements, analyze them, and develop tests. The specifications are also paper-based. They're extremely easy to misinterpret. Um, my own personal experience was that one night, very late, we, we gave a software requirement update to a software development engineers in India. We asked them to update a 100 by 100 table. Before I joined the MathWorks, I, uh, I worked as a wire harness engineer, and nothing frustrated me more than intermittent wire problems. Uh, the only thing more fun is wireless. Uh, so, and Wi Fi. <laughs> uh, so, we, we, gave, we gave specification to update a small 10 by 10 portion of this 100 by 100 uh, lookup table. And what we got back the next morning was exactly what we had asked for. They had deleted the 100 by 100 lookup table, gave us a 10 by 10 lookup table, and it was perfectly what we asked for. Except it didn't work because we were missing 90% of our, of our data. And so I think, again, sort of paper specifications or natural language specifications can be, can be incomplete and easily misinterpreted. And then, of course, physical prototypes are expensive, not to mention my own personal experiences that they're always late and take longer to develop than anybody ever wants them to. Um, manual coding is time consuming and can introduce uh, errors. And then lastly, sort of traditional testing comes late and at the end. And model-based design sort of turns a lot of that on its head. And to me, the most important part and what my personal experience has been is that actually the small part to the right in terms of the testing and verification being done throughout the process is really where the value comes in. And time and time again, when we work with customers around the world, and again from my own personal experience, moving the testing up so that you're developing requirements-based tests and you're applying those tests to your design at a model level and you're, you're finding errors where they get introduced um, really has an, a huge payback. And so... I gave a lecture once to 500 people and I, and I couldn't get the microphone. <coughs> self-evident from, uh, from the existence of essentially doing, being able to start to do the testing very early on and carry those tests through. The next, the next thing that we tend to, to interact with customers on is once they've uh, accepted the idea of moving from a, from a document-based and a hand-coding process to a model process is how to go about adopting it. And again, where the math works, uh, so we put everything into a matrix. It makes most sense to us, and uh, three by three matrices are pretty straightforward. Um, and we, we, look, uh, we look sort of across one axis in terms of getting to code quickly, and we look along another axis towards verification. And again, sort of uh, starting in the lower left and working to the upper right, customers tend to adopt modeling first as a graphical way to describe things. And, and there's a tremendous value to moving from a, a spoken language to a, to a pictorial language. And then moving along to rapid prototyping, 
and then graphical programming. And this is, by graphical programming, there are many customers that actually sort of draw a picture of the way they want the code to work and then generate code without really running through a full battery of simulation-based tests. Moving up the, uh, the, the uh, axes on the y-axis, we start to see customers start to adopt more simulation-based work. So not just drawing the pictures, but hitting the simulation button. First doing closed-loop simulation, then hardware in the loop design, and then actual, as, uh, as Shmuel mentioned, simula simulation-based development where simulation is actually a core part of the milestones that you have to go through. Simulation-based tests actually allow you to pass through those milestones. And then finally, along the, t the top is actually a requirements-based process that's in the models. So there's sort of a, a, a structured verification and validation process at a model level. There's system-level integration and validation. And then finally, what a colleague of mine likes to call fully leveraged model-based design. And this is where what you can do in the models, you're doing in the model. So your models are linked to the requirements database. You have requirements-based tests that you develop inside of your modeling environment and apply first to your models, and then all the way through uh, to, your, to your hardware. So with that sort of structure in mind, uh, a few years back, um, a group of us got together. So I, I should have maybe perhaps started by introducing myself uh, which, because my Hebrew is broken, I don't know how much Shmuel introduced me. Um, but I'm, I'm Dr. Jonathan Friedman, so I have a PhD in control theory, which most of my thesis, like probably many of you in the room, was written in MATLAB and Simulink. Um, I, I did uh, system identification work at the frequency domain. I worked in H-Infinity. If anybody over lunch wants to have a debate as to whether the Bonnock space or the Hilbert space is the most fun infinite functional topology to work in, I'm your guy to have that discussion with. After that, I went to Ford Motor Company in addition to having a number of other jobs along the way. And at Ford Motor Company, I worked with the MathWorks on model-based design for powertrain control. I also worked on model-based design at NASA. And I, I've sort of done my rounds of working on model-based design. From that, I developed a sort of set of um, lessons learned. And at the MathWorks, I'm privileged to work with people that have similar backgrounds to myself, that have worked in many different companies working to apply these ideas. And so we sat down and we started making a list of the things that had worked really well and the things that had worked really badly. Because uh, our feeling was that actually in a lot of ways, we could probably learn more from the things that hadn't gone well than the things that had gone well. And so the best practices come from actually most of those sort of very, very bad experiences that we then tried to turn around to positive things that we all, on the second or third time that we were working on model-based design, tried to avoid. And then lastly, a friend of mine said, well, why are there 10? And actually, when we sat down, we got to about 14 of them. Uh, but somebody in marketing said, well, it's better to have a round number. So we combined a few and got to 10. So there are 10 of them. And I'll try to go through them and, and give you examples of, of of customers that we've worked with that have really um, uh, you know, done a great job of implementing them. So the first is to identify the problem you're trying to solve. And uh, I, I, the first time when I was at uh, Ford, the problem we were trying to solve uh, was not actually the adoption of model-based design. The problem we were trying to solve is that our powertrain control development process was taking too long and had too many late changes. And the thing to do is, is, again, sort of work to have metrics and to attack the greatest weakness first. And along the way, measure your ROI. And your ROI, again, will be based on where you see the greatest, uh, return, er, the greatest weakness that you have. So as I said, we had missed release dates. We had, we had software defects. Um, and, and the example I like to use is actually from Lear. And one of the reasons that Lear Corporation started working with MathWorks to adopt model-based design was they actually had a requirements problem. And the requirements problem uh, came from the fact that in working with an automotive OEM, again, the requirements they were given were often incomplete, inconsistent, hard to understand. And what they did is they started to capture those requirements and functional models and share those models with, uh, with their customers. And the, the key result that is the first one, that they were able to validate their requirements early and, and to get that early feedback as opposed to having late design changes. 
And they went from uh, sort of uh, roughly on average finding about 30% of the requirements problems to, to over 95%. And that had a huge impact on their downstream quality, their ability to deliver on time, and, and all of the uh, issues with, with late design changes. The next is something that a, a, a colleague of mine liked to call the rule of two. And, and so we made it best practice number two, because it became easy to think about that. And that's, that's that you should, have the, you should think of the models uh, for two things, because it's expensive to build models. And it's hard to build them. And then it's harder to maintain them, right? And so to overcome those startup costs and to really ingrain the models as part of the process, there should be, it, there should be two reasons you're using the models. It could be to validate the requirements as Lear did through simulation, but then also to move into rapid prototyping. It can be to use them as, a, as an executable specification and automatic code generation. And here, um, I think a good example of this comes from, from Airbus. And uh, they were using the models uh, for a couple different pro reasons. One was that they, they knew that they wanted to move again from a, from a paper-based process to, to model, but they were using them as part of their ARP 4754 process. So, so they had an external reason to use models. And then they also were using them to communicate to their suppliers. So this was the system engineering group at Airbus, and they wanted to validate their system level requirements. Rule three is, or best practice number three, is to use the models for production code generation. And and um, one time when we were first presenting these, that somebody, uh, somebody in the audience sort of uh, challenged uh, uh, a colleague of mine who was presenting, said, well, of course, you're just trying to sell code generation, so you're going to tell everybody they should use the models for code gen. But this actually comes from a very personal experience for, for me, which was that um, we had built, at, uh, at one of my early uh, jobs, we had built models of our control algorithms, and we had validated them. And we, we, we had worked to integrate them, and then we had worked to generate code from them. And then we got to a milestone in, in, in our build process at this car company where we had a software problem. And we, we gathered around a, a conference room table at about 7 p.m. at night to go through the open issues from the day's build. And uh, our, my software error came up, and the plant manager said, how long will it take to fix this? And I said, well, I have to go back. I have to determine where in the model the error was introduced. We, we had figured out in root cause what the problem was, but now we need to trace it back to the model. So said, first we have to go back to the model. Then we have to test the model. Then we need to generate code. Then we want to test the code. Then we need to integrate the code. And he just put up his hands and said, I've, I've heard enough. I want code. I want it tomorrow. And I don't want to hear another word about models. And I worked for you know, very smart and dedicated people, and we, we sort of gathered after that meeting, and we said, well, what are we going to do? And, and my boss looked at me and said, we're going to get code, we're going to get it out tonight, we're going to integrate it, and we're going to test it. And we completely abandoned the models. And by the end of the build, we, we had so far deviated in our process that, that the code and the models looked nothing alike. And we always promised ourselves we would go back and we would fix all the models. But I think that, that was an ideal that we never quite reached because as soon as we were done, we moved on to the next thing. And I got a phone call a few weeks after I'd finished up the builds and somebody said, hey, we're, we're going to start our next powertrain development process and we'd like to use the models you built. And I said, I wouldn't bother because they're not, they don't represent the code that we launched and they have a bunch of errors in them. And so this becomes very personal that, that when, you, when you aren't linking what actually goes into production to the models, then it's very easy to let the models rot. And, and, and so it becomes a very personal statement that, that the model needs to be product, uh, connected to what goes into production. And an example here to, to, that, that's had a, a fundamental impact on the math works is, is the work with Toyota. And, uh, and Toyota, um, Toyota, Daimler, and Ford originally uh, worked with the MathWorks on the development of model-based design for automotive uh, powertrain production, and it's since moved on beyond that. And Toyota uh, continues to, to uh, as do the others, use model-based design in their production process for, for code generation, for powertrain. Um, and I think you can see that they have a faster response time to market demands and they get technology out um, quicker to the marketplace. 
Uh, best practice number four is to treat the models as the sole truth. And this, again, goes back to, to my, uh, my, my, uh, my story in terms of once you start to treat the model as just uh, an artifact along the way as opposed to where all of your, your truth lies, it becomes very easy to update the artifacts versus the truth. So if, if the specification documents are generated from the model and the code is generated from the model, then when you have a problem, you will fix it in the model. You won't, you know, open up a Word doc and change a word. And it, it really does remove the temptation to hack code and to prevent that divergence. And to me, a good example of this is when you go into a, a DO178 process. And that's because, essentially, there, there's an external auditor <laughs> tracing back everything that you're doing. And if you can have the discipline to essentially have that traceability and that, that pedigree of all the artifacts that you produce, then, then you're treating the model as the sole source of truth. And uh, again, MathWorks has had the privilege to work with customers around the world. In this case, it was Eurocopter. Um, and they were working on, a, um, on, on actually the uh, window defrosters um, for the uh, EC-130. Uh, number five is, is uh, also really important, which is to use the, um, the migration process from your traditional development process to model-based design as a learning process. And, and this also is, again, from, from experiences that uh, another colleague of mine had where um, building the models becomes a challenge, as I mentioned. And then what you do with those models becomes a challenge. So uh, almost everybody that has either C or HDL or other file, you know, uh, text-based code, a lot of the work gets done in, at a file level. And training, uh, engineers are trained to write code and to think about things from a code level and the testing environment and all of these things. And so as you move from a traditional process to a model-based process, you start to have to change the way that you do things. So if you, it, the, the, the example here is actually NASA. So NASA um, developed uh, the, the Orion flight control system using model-based design. And one of the first things that they identified was the need to have a, um, a, a, a model style guide and to automate that process. So, one of the things that translates is when you write code, you have a coding style, and you have a coding style so that people can maintain the code, or when somebody leaves, the next person understands the structure of the code, and you have a modeling style the same, for the same reason. They also use the modeling style to enforce certain rules so that they could generate code both for production and for their simulation environment. What am I doing on time? Time? Five minutes? Yeah, okay. No, 20, oh. <laughs> then I'm fine. <laughs> um, the, the number six is actually to focus on design and not coding. Again, I think um, this is uh, one that I think we're all aware of. So maybe a quick question. Um, how many people uh, uh, would consider themselves sort of a coder, somebody who writes a lot of code? All right. And how many people would consider themselves an algorithm design engineer? All right. So for, for the people that are coders, um, how often do you get uh, algorithms that don't make any sense? Okay, probably never, because as an algorithm designer myself, my algorithms were perfect. Uh, they made absolute sense to me, and, uh, and I never quite understood why I got so many questions. And I think this is, this is part of the struggle, which is actually algorithm engineers, in all fairness, try actually to think about their algorithms so that eventually, because we're all learning how to write code, even my nine-year-old now is uh, slinging C code in MATLAB, um, that, that when we go to design, we're actually already starting to think about the coding of it. And, and what model-based design can allow you to do is to separate these things and to separate the, the, the design work so that you can have a good design and it can be done in a structured way. And then to work towards having the, 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 the software engineering work, actually architect good software that's maintainable and testable and traceable, while the algorithm work can be left to the, to the algorithm design engineers. And you can use the modeling process to do the design work and the testing and, and, and really sort of move from needing code to do the design work to, 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 designing separ uh, to designing independently. 
And, and um, in this case, I think a good, a, good rep, a good example of this is FLIR Corporation. And when they moved from their traditional development process, they, they were able to separate the need to have HDL to, to test their designs, to be able to test their designs inside of, of MATLAB and, and to simulate their algorithms um, for their thermal imaging FPGAs. And that, that really allowed them to, to really compress the amount of time um, uh, from, from testing. Because again, where I came from, uh, an algorithm was a wonderful thing, but it couldn't do anything until it was in code. And code, while beautiful, can't do anything until it's on hardware. And so when you can separate the need to have everything finally on hardware to being able to abstract it away and do the design work on the desktop, you can really compress a lot of the time down and, and really improve the quality of the design. Um, the uh, Number seven is to integrate the development process. So models can't be something, again, that you sort of do on the side or that you learn as you go. Um, of course, they can be. That's the way a lot of it gets done. But really, the best practices and, um, are when it's fully integrated into the to the development process. So that new engineers come on board and learn the right way to model. Uh, that, that, that the milestones that your development processes have to pass through include artifacts that either are generated by the models or a model review. That there are supporting tools such as configuration management or, um, or variant management that, that are model based and, and at the model level and that it's fully integrated into the process. And again, some of these best practices are, are linked. This is also something that if you use the adoption of model-based design as a learning process versus outsourcing it, you'll find these things as you go along. So again, a colleague of mine, the company they worked for, as, we mentioned, as I've mentioned a couple of times, it's hard to find time and energy to build models. And so their solution was to hire a company in a remote location to essentially reverse engineer all their C code into models. And they had this vision of one day on a Friday shutting all the computers down that were all based on C code and Word documents, and on Monday coming back in and firing up and everybody would be in models. And Monday they came back and everybody fired up and they had install problems on MATLAB, People weren't pointing to the right servers where the models were. Nobody knew how to check models in and out of the configuration management system. And they essentially shut down work on the product development process for about a week and a half, which, at least in my experience, a week and a half is a huge amount of time to lose. And so we typically work with uh, customers and we say, define a pilot project. And pilot projects can mean a lot of different things to different groups. But the, the other thing is that pilot projects should be something that, that's not something sort of way off uh, the beaten path, but, but a, a core part of your development process, a contained core part of your development process, because that way you'll pull in these other parts that are critical. And we worked with GM on this, and GM, uh, when they were developing their next generation of hybrids, they decided, GM had been working on model-based design for a while, a lot of their powertrains are come through using model-based design, but when they, when they went to develop their, their, um, their next generation of hybrid vehicles, that was an opportunity where they didn't have a lot of legacy uh, code that they needed to integrate, and so they could um, really work hard to make sure that they had a fully, fully integrated process. Um, this one is probably the one non-technical one, and the non-HR one, or, or any of the other ones. This is, this is really uh, one that, again, comes from, from years of, of experience, which is to, to find the champion or to designate the champion who has influence and budgetary control. And this is going to sound silly, but because as an engineer, I, I always thought that when you had the right tools and the right technology and the right amount of time, which was always my challenge, that I could get anything done. And it actually turned out that, that you really need somebody uh, with a vision to kind of move forward on things that also has the authority to assign the people and the budget and the time to get things done. And without that person, the, the sort of groundswell of wanting to use models 
eventually meets the top-down pressure of needing to deliver to the marketplace and to meet budgets. And without that person identified, then, then the, the challenges are, are sometimes too great to overcome. But with that person identified, then a lot of times challenges that you would expect to kind of derail things uh, are, are able to be uh, met and, uh, and overcome. And to me, a great example of this is the, is the Joint Strike Fighter program, uh, which is sort of a multinational, uh, multi, um, yeah, multinational project. And, and I don't hold it up as a project that somehow has been seamless and without problems. And, and it has its own set of challenges. And you're probably, if you're like me, you're still reading about them in the newspaper. Um, but the thing that, that's really most impressive to me about this is that that the Joint Strike Fighter program had one real simple goal in terms of the control system that they were developing, which is they wanted a single control system that would be able to be, uh, have enough flexibility that it could handle all three variants of the Joint Strike Fighter. So for those of you who don't know, there are three variants of the Strike Fighter. They call them A, B, and C. So asphalt, so it's a traditional uh, runway takeoff and landing, beach, uh, so the beach is sort of the stovall, the, the, the quick jumper, and then C is carrier. And this was really important for the team working on the, uh, on the control system and the flight control system because they knew if they had to build three separate flight control systems, then the amount of time that they were going to have to do all of the testing and verification work would just, they, they weren't going to get enough people to get it done. And again, at a, at a senior level within the uh, Lockheed Flight Control Group, they, they had that vision and they had that budgetary control and they, they moved forward on it and were able to achieve that. And I should have jumped to this slide. Um, the, the next one is just to take a second and, and to acknowledge the fact that process changes are slow when they're done well, and, and to have that long-term vision. And I think to, you know, I, I spent last night going back through the different stories and, and different customers that I've had the, the fortune to work with uh, over the years to try to pick one. But I would say that any of the ones that I've mentioned today and, and, and many more, including some here in Israel, that, that have adopted model-based design and continue to adopt model-based design um, and, and move from sort of traditional tools to taking advantage of new computer-based tools. Th these are the companies that have that long vision because it doesn't, it doesn't simply, you can't simply leave on a Friday and come back on a Monday and turn on the lights. That, that it is a process that you have to go through and there will be challenges along the way. Um, but to have that long-term vision that, that the return on that investment is significant um, in, in many different ways. And then lastly is probably sort of a, a, a plea as, or a request as much as a best practice, um, which is to partner with your tool suppliers. I think, you know, this, this is MathWorks and Systematics. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter which tool vendor. Um, the, the, the reason why is adopting new tools is a challenge. And the surface area of those tools is large. And the thing that we try to do, speaking for is the systematics and the math works, we, we try to be experts in our tools. And you're experts in your application. And together, we can, we can really make that adoption process go very smoothly. Now, I also was an engineer, so when somebody would say to me, you should ask for help, my answer always was, sure, uh, I'll ask for help, but leave me alone until I ask. Uh, because I'd much prefer to do it alone. And I think there, there's, there's really a just huge number of great success stories out there. The one that I picked comes from automotive. Um, when you're doing calibration work in automotive, it's as much art as it is science. So the calibrators, uh, and if any of you have ever worked in the auto industry, engine calibration is sort of the magic that makes the engine work correctly. And the first thing that every calibrator does when they're given a new engine is to turn off all the nonsense that the software engineers have put into their engine. And then slowly start to turn them back on. And for, for 20 or 30 years, that is the way calibrators have calibrated engines. And then sort of mathematics came along and math models of the engines came along. And it turned out that you can actually do a pretty good job getting to a much better 
uh, minimal state in terms of balancing the need for fuel economy, performance, and emissions using mathematics than you can using a really smart engineer turning knobs. Uh, but it's challenging because the topology of an engine is not linear time invariant. So we were having a good laugh the other night that at least where I came from, everything we assumed was linear time invariant because you can say much more interesting things mathematically about linear time invariant systems than you can about nonlinear time varying uh, systems. And an engine is a nonlinear time varying system. And, and so the topology of that optimization problem is, is pretty challenging. But the mathematics are there, and the tools work really well when they're applied. And the partnership can lead to really amazing results. And in this case, um, Mazda got out their Sky Active technology, and they continue to sort of um, uh, change the way that, that engines uh, work uh, through that. Oops. So, um, these are the 10 best practices. The, the, we actually took time to collect them all into an SAE paper, and it's available um, from the MathWorks website or from the SAE website. MathWorks doesn't charge you for it, SAE will. So it's your choice where you want to go get it, if you're interested. Um, but, but we tried to share sort of both our experiences and our best practices. And again, sort of going back to that last one, I'd really encourage you to, to work with systematics. Um, to, to look for those opportunities to deploy model-based design uh, within your organization and to really um, let them help you uh, be successful in adoption of the tools and also let them be your gateway if you do have challenges with the tools back to the math works. Um, I, you know, somebody one time asked me when I, when I made a similar statement, what does that mean? Well, Shmuel has my phone number. He knows how to get a hold of me. He also knows I don't sleep very much. Um, and so there's lots of ways to do that, but, but they are the local team that can really have an, you know, help you adopt these tools. And this maybe it's just sort of a last personal statement. For, so I've worked for, I mentioned I've worked for a number of different companies, and one of the things that almost every company has is a mission statement, right? And as an engineer, we're sort of genetically uh, built to make fun of mission statements. They don't, they don't mean a lot. They can kind of come off sounding silly. MathWorks' mission statement is to accelerate the pace of discovery in engineering and science. And I can honestly tell you in the nine companies I've ever worked for, I couldn't tell you what their mission statement was. But, but every single day with every single member of the MathWorks community around the world, including Systematics, we get up and we try to figure out how to fulfill that mission statement. And, and, and it's our privilege when you let us help you do that. Um, so that's the end of my talk. So thank you very much.